So we've talked about water quality issues and things in the water that can be of concern. And so this leads to the, the next step, which would be how do we treat the water to make that water safe to drink. And as we begin to move into that discussion, maybe a good question to think about is, where is the safest water on Earth? When you think about naturally occurring water on Earth, where do you think about as, as the safest water? And different answers come to mind. You might think about groundwater, and that would be a good answer. You might think about rainwater, water coming down from the sky, and that would be a good answer. You might think about mountain streams up in the, the Rocky Mountains, that pristine water coming down from the snow melt. And you might think about, well, what about glaciers and maybe the Arctic ice? And those would all be good answers. But let me share with you some issues that might come up with each of those sources of water. While we would think of them as being the safest water on Earth, each of them can have issues associated with them. And so this helps us to realize we need to be aware and cautious. Well, let's start with the groundwater. The groundwater is safer than the surface water because the surface water may have pathogens in it that may cause the spread of disease. And we talked about London and Chicago in the 1800s and Milwaukee in 1993. And so we might think, well, the groundwater, as the water flows through the ground, uh, those pathogens die off and that water is safer. And that's assuming that there's not surface influences on the groundwater that might be introducing pathogens directly into the groundwater. And that'd be exactly true. But we can think about naturally occurring arsenic that might be in that groundwater, like in Norman, Oklahoma. And so we need to think about that groundwater. What about the rainwater? It's not coming in contact with the geology, so it's not dissolving things out of the geologic materials. Well, it turns out, as that rain falls through the sky, uh, we can get acid rain. And what is acid rain? Well, you may have nitrogen oxides, you may have sulfur oxides in the atmosphere, coal combustion and other activities, and as the rain falls through that, it may dissolve those compounds into the rain, and you may get acid rain. And so that's something we need to worry about, think about. And the black forest in Germany, uh, the trees started dying because of the acid rain. What about the mountain stream water? There your snow melt up in the Rockies. Well, if you talk to a backpacker, people that go backpacking up in the mountains that have experience, they know not to trust that water. They know that you need to boil the water, you need to add iodine tablets, or you need some special filter. Uh, to make that water safe. It turns out the deer and the beavers that are living up in those mountains, they can excrete uh, Giardia and Cryptosporidium into the water and you can get deathly ill from that water. Well, what about the, the Arctic ice, uh, the glaciers? Well, interestingly enough, we find that chlorofluorocarbons, a freon and other types of compounds that have gotten into the atmosphere can move through the atmosphere up to the Arctic ice and partitioning the ice, and so we actually find these chemicals in that, that ice. And so all of these waters that we think about as being the safest may actually have water quality issues associated with them. So because of water quality issues that we may have, we think about treating the water. We treat water for several different reasons, and we have several different what we call regulations or standards. We have primary standards. And these standards are focused on human health, preventing the spread of disease like cholera, typhoid fever, uh, preventing the exposure to compounds that may cause cancer. And so these are primary standards to protect the water that we drink. We also have secondary standards. These secondary standards aren't designed to protect human health. They're more for aesthetic reasons, how the water appears. And so maybe the water, for example, like Thunderbird, east of Norman. If you take a glass of water, of like Thunderbird water, and you hold it up, you'll see a lot of uh, fine particles, we call that turbidity, in the water. And it almost has a little bit of a red, reddish color to it. That's because the iron particles in those fine particles give that color to it. Now those uh, solids in the water may or may not be health issues, but they're certainly not very pleasing to look at. Iron in the water. You may, uh, if your groundwater it has reducing conditions in the absence of oxygen, you may get iron dissolved in the water. Now, I remember a time uh, when my wife was on an iron supplement diet, adding more iron into her diet, 
At the same time, the city of Memphis was taking iron out of the drinking water. So that wasn't a health standard. That was because that iron that was in the water, if it comes into the home and it's in your washing machine and that iron precipitates, your white shirts or your white tablecloths become pink. And so that's more of an aesthetic concern, a visual concern. Uh, so these are a couple of the reasons that we treat water. For health concerns, that's the number one, to prevent the spread of disease, to prevent uh, the episodes of cholera and typhoid fever that we know from our history. But then there are also things that we do to make the water more pleasing for the consumer. Well, the type of treatment we consider is a function of the source of the water. We can have river water can be our source. Our source could be a lake, like Lake Thunderbird for Norman. Or it could be groundwater. And Norman historically used groundwater was its source of water. But when Lake Thunderbird was built in the um, late 60s, early 70s, in that time frame, uh, that became a source of water. And so you have different types of treatment process to, as a function of what's in the water as a function of the source of the water. So let's talk about treating water that's like a river water or, or lake water that has these fine particles, this turbidity in the water. And one of the first things we want to do is to remove that turbidity, to clear up that water so that it's more aesthetically pleasing. It turns out these particles are so fine that they won't settle out very quickly. If you have a river water, like the Mississippi River, you'll have sand that will be in the water because of the, the turbulence, the energy in the water will even be able to suspend sand. And that'll settle, the sand will settle out very quickly. But these fine clay particles settle much slower. And so one of the first steps we do is to take that water and to make those fine particles so that they'll come together and become larger particles so that they will settle out by gravity. Now the process that we use to get these fine particles to come together, we call them to aggregate or agglomerate, is called coagulation. And coagulation is a process whereby we take these particles that normally don't want to attach and we add some chemicals that change the nature of the surfaces of these particles so that they will attach. And when they come together, they attach and they become larger and they'll settle out by gravity. And so that we call that coagulation and the process of the particles coming together and colliding and aggregating, we call flocculation. Here's a picture from the Draper Water Treatment Plant in Oklahoma City. And in the left side of the picture, what we see is this turbid water, look kind of brownish in nature and we're doing the coagulation and flocculation, and as you look to the right part of the figure, you see the water is clearer. In the basin, we have these, these boards, and, and they look kind of like a paddle wheel on the back of a paddle wheel boat, and these paddles rotate very slowly and encourage those particles to collide and aggregate so they become large enough, and so if you look beyond, you see the water is clearer because the larger particles that we've helped create now settle out of the water, and the water is much clearer. So the next step after coagulation, flocculation, and settling, gravity settling, is we go into a filter. And here what we mean by a filter is a sand filter, a, a bed of sand that the water flows through. It helps to further remove these fine particles that haven't settled out by gravity. Yeah, actually, this is from Bangkok, Thailand. And they take water from the Shafaya River, and they coagulate, flocculate it, and then they put it in the sand filter. You might say, well, where's the sand? What we're seeing in this picture is the water, uh, as it's flowing downwards, we can't tell that it's flowing downwards because it's doing it at a very slow rate, but it's flowing down through sand that's below the water surface. So looking now at the next picture, we see what we've done is we've drained the water down in this basin to where now we're seeing the top of the sand. And we're doing this because we're getting ready to clean the filter. We've been using this filter long enough, it's become very clogged with all the material that's been removed in the sand. And so in this next picture we see what we've done is we've begun to flush water back up through the filter in the opposite direction and we're displacing all this trapped material and we see the color of the water in this case is kind of brownish. And that reflects the brown particles that were in the surface water that were trapped by the sand filter but now we're cleaning that sand filter, removing all that dirt that had accumulated in it so that we can continue to use the sand filter uh, for additional treatment of water. So that was a sand filter for Bangkok, Thailand, which was treating a surface water. Now, if we look at the next picture, we see a sand filter, and this is from Memphis, Tennessee. 
Now we see the color of this water is different. Instead of being brownish, or kind of like a, a, a chocolate milk or a weak chocolate milk color, we see it's reddish. And this reflects the fact that in Memphis, it's not the Mississippi River water that they're treating, it's the groundwater. And they're pumping the water up from the ground and that water has iron in it. And so what they're doing is they're precipitating the iron and then they're filtering out that iron in their sand filter. So what we're seeing in this picture is they're running water back through that filter in the opposite direction and the iron is becoming displaced from the sand and now we're re regenerating that sand filter so it can be used to treat additional water. So this would be the steps of coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, gravity settling, and now filtration, a sand filter to help polish or further improve the quality of the water. But what's the most important reason that we treat water? Is to prevent the spread of disease, cholera, typhoid fever. And so the next picture we're looking at, this is a disinfection process. And here what we see are tanks, and these tanks have chlorine in them. And this chlorine is being added into the water at just the right concentration to help disinfect that water to kill any pathogens that might be in the water. And remember, this is the most important reason we treat the water, is to prevent the spread of disease, to prevent the epidemics from cholera or typhoid fever. Removing the iron, removing the turbidity, the solids, that makes the water more pleasant. But treating it with the disinfectant, that makes it safe and prevents the spread of disease. So in this example I showed in Memphis, it was chlorine was the disinfectant. Chlorine gas added into the water to give a residual chlorine to make the water safe to drink. And you want to make sure that chlorine residual stays in the water distribution system so the water coming out of the tap still has that so the water can't be recontaminated by pathogens in the distribution system. This is why I don't drink the water in a developing country. In Bangkok, I've seen the water treatment plant. I trust the water at the water treatment plant, but I don't trust it at my hotel because I'm concerned that it might have been recontaminated in the distribution system. And so in the U.S. and Europe, uh, developed countries, we make sure there's a certain residual level of chlorine or our disinfectant at the tap to keep that water safe. We can use other disinfectants like ozone or UV light. These can help to disinfect the water and UV light and ozone are better for cryptosporidium and certain pathogens. But they don't leave a residual. Uh, they won't stay in the water all the way to the tap. So even if we use them, we need to add another chemical to keep that residual disinfectant in the distribution system. And just uh, one more picture. I've shown you a couple of very large water treatment plants. Here's a very small water treatment plant. And this is from a rural community in central Missouri. We were just driving by and I saw this and stopped and took a picture of it. And this is a system where they're removing iron. And what you're seeing are a series of trays. They pump this water up, it has iron in it, and they put it in these trays and as the water flows from the top down through these trays, it gets aerated, it gets exposed to oxygen, and the iron precipitates, and then they're able to remove the iron. And so this is a small plant for a small community as opposed to the large plants that I've shown you before. Well, having talked about water treatment, once we use the water in our home, the water goes down the drain and it goes to the wastewater treatment plant. And we need to make sure that water is safe before it goes into the river or lake or the receiving stream. And so next, let's talk about wastewater treatment. So we treat this wastewater to make it safe to discharge into the river or the stream. And one of the major concerns if this, that wastewater isn't treated, as that waste goes into the river and stream, it will consume all the oxygen as the um, microorganisms consume those organics, they'll use up the oxygen. And what happens to a river if it doesn't have oxygen in it? Well, what happens to the fish if there's no oxygen in the fish tank? Well, the fish die. And so fish and other, many other organisms require oxygen to be able to live in these streams and lakes. And so what we want to do is we want to get these organics that are in these wastewater, we want to degrade that and we want to provide all the oxygen that's necessary in a treatment plant so when that wastewater goes into the river, it doesn't deplete the oxygen in the river. And so the way we do that is through a series of processes in wastewater treatment. So this next picture you're seeing is a picture of the Shafaya River in Bangkok, Thailand. 
My first trip to Bangkok in 1992, I wanted to go see a wastewater treatment plant. The only thing is, in 1992, Bangkok had no wastewater treatment plants. The human waste went into the ditches, into the creeks, and into the Shafaya River untreated. And the dissolved oxygen level in the river was virtually zero, which meant no fish, no aquatic life could live in that water. I'm happy to report, since 1992, Bangkok has implemented wastewater treatment and the Shafaya River now does support fish life again. But this is an example of what can happen in the absence. And we in the United States, we were in that same position in the 1950s and 1960s before we started implementing the wastewater treatment that we, uh, is so common today. When we look at a wastewater treatment plant, what's the first process that we might encounter at the plant? And the first process could be a filter, a screen, to remove large materials that come into the plant. And so that's what we see in this next picture. It's just a screen, kind of like a, a screen door, if you will, a screen uh, that helps to remove the larger materials from that water. And then we'd next go into a process that just a, allows time for heavy things to settle out. And they say that one of the things that shows up in this settling basin initially, coffee grounds. Sometimes people will flush that down the toilet and it makes it to the wastewater treatment plant and so that gets settled out. And so we have simple physical processes of screening and then gravity settling and that removes those types of materials. But now we're starting to talk about those dissolved materials. We put some food down our food grinder or down the garbage disposal that goes down the drain. Uh, we could take those things and put them out in the compost pile. And we have a compost pile at our house and so those things would, those organics would break down in a compost pile, but sometimes we use our, our garbage disposal and it goes down the drain. And if that goes into the river, it'll consume the oxygen in the river, just like it consumes oxygen in our compost pile as it degrades. And so now we need to think about how can we design processes to help remove those organic compounds that won't be removed with the screens or won't be removed by settling. So what we do to remove these organics is actually somewhat similar to what we do in a compost pile. If you've ever worked with a compost pile, you put the organics, you always like to have uh, compost that's already been composted because you can put that in and that brings the microorganisms. And you need some moisture, you need water. And you turn your compost pile and that's to keep it aerated. So these are some of the important ingredients when we're thinking about trying to do biological degradation of organic compounds. And so how do we do this in a wastewater treatment plant? And I always like it when I go to a wastewater treatment plant and they have several basins and one is in operation but one's down because they're doing maintenance. Because you can see what it looks like when it has water in it but you can see what it looks like when it's empty. And that's very nice in this picture. This is a wastewater treatment plant from Memphis, Tennessee. And to the left we see a uh, unit that's in operation. The wastewater's flowing through it and we see the basin filled with water. In the center we see a basin that's dry. And if you notice down at the bottom of that basin, you see a pipe. And that pipe has little diffusers coming out of it. It's very similar to what you do in a fish tank. In a fish tank, at the bottom of the tank, you put a little diffuser and you pump air in. And that provides the air that the fish need to stay alive. What we're doing in this basin and we're bringing the wastewater and we're providing air and we're also bringing in microorganisms. We're taking settled sludge and returning it and we're bringing all these ingredients together so that the organics can break down in this basin in this engineered treatment system rather than happening in the river itself. So what happens in this basin is you have microorganisms, they see food and they eat that food to them, what to us is the wastewater, them is food. They say pizza, get excited and start eating and they break down these organics and they multiply in a process. And so we produce uh, lots of uh, microorganisms or what we call um, sludge. We go into the next basin which is shown here and this is a settling basin and we allow that sludge, those microorganisms to settle out to the bottom and the water that comes off the top is devoid of the organics, but also we've settled out the sludge, the solids, the microorganisms, and so now we're ready to discharge this water to the river. You see off in the horizon is the Mississippi River, and so now Memphis has treated this wastewater, it's removed the solids, it's removed the organics, it's settled out the microorganisms, and it's ready to send this water on to the Mississippi River, 
and the oxygen level in the Mississippi River won't be depleted because we satisfied that oxygen demand in this engineered treatment system. So we protected the receiving body. We've also protected people downstream that might pull out Mississippi River water because we've removed potential pathogens that were in the water uh, to protect the downstream users. So we now talked about treating the wastewater to remove the solid particles and to remove the organics, the dissolved organics. Depending upon the where the wastewater is going into, if that wastewater is going into a lake, we may need to remove nitrogen and phosphorus from the wastewater as well. Because those may be limiting factors that are preventing growth of large amounts of algae. And that algae can potentially consume oxygen in the water and have a negative impact on the water. So there are certain situations where we need to go beyond just simply removing the organics and remove the nitrogen, the phosphorus as well. So we've talked now about water treatment, wastewater treatment, and in looking at these processes we found the combination of physics, gravity settling, chemistry, adding chemicals to achieve certain removal processes, microbiology, we see math, uh, we see public health, and so hopefully get a sense of how all these different disciplines come together to help us achieve our goal of making our water safe, our, our wastewater safe for the environment and human health. But just as a final thing, let's think about what might this look like in a developing country where people are in a village, a hundred families in a village living on less than a dollar per day. Don't have the resources to build these sophisticated types of processes that we're talking about. And those applications, we might be thinking about instead of a wastewater treatment plant, we might be thinking about a latrine. But interestingly enough, we th maybe think of a latrine of being at a state park or a campground, but there's actually some technology that can go into improving latrines. And so we talk about ventilated improved pit, VIP latrines. And we talk about eco-latrines or composting latrines. And so there's some technology that can go into making the management of the wastewater more effective even in these developing countries. In terms of water treatment, we can think about simple things. Instead of a large water treatment plant, we might be looking at a, at a bottle of chlorine where we add a capful of the chlorine into a certain amount of the water. We might be looking at taking water and putting it in a, in a Coke bottle and putting it on the roof. And the UV light and the sunlight can disinfect that water. So we might be looking at very simple. We might be looking at ceramic water filters or biosand filters. So very simple technologies that use the same concepts but are more appropriate for that setting. So in this lesson we talked about the importance of water treatment, the importance of wastewater treatment, and some of the different concepts and processes that we can use trying to make the waters safer for human consumption, more pleasant for human consumption, safer to discharge into the environment, safer for people that might be using the water downstream after we discharge it into the environment. And we're hopefully You've seen now the importance of water treatment and wastewater treatment to public health and to society as we know it.